Great. In terms of disclosures, um, I wanted to tell you that I've received research funding from Regeneron, and I also am a scientific advisor to Regeneron and Genentech. And on behalf of my co-investigators today, I wanted to discuss a cause of vision loss of patients with optic distrusion that many people might not be aware of. We know that there are several vision-threatening complications associated with optic distrusion. We've discussed the visual field defects that can occur in patients who have these buried drusen, and they can also be accompanied by ischemic optic neuropathies. But we must also remember that in some patients, optic distrusion can also be a risk factor for developing choroidal neovascularization. Choroidal neovascularization is the proliferation of abnormal blood vessels these CNV membranes that penetrate the basement membrane. And often this can occur in the setting of drusen. We're most familiar with choroidal neovascularization in the setting of age-related macular degeneration, which is a condition also accompanied by drusen. But in eyes with optic drusen, CNV can also occur. How often does it occur? Recently, our colleagues at Duke University, led by Dr. Duncan, looked at the incidence and prevalence of neovascular membranes in the pediatric population. They are a tertiary hospital, and they found that in their pediatric population, 24% of these eyes had evidence of CNV membranes. That means almost one in four children with optic distrusion had evidence of abnormal blood vessel proliferation in the peripapillary region. What about adults? What is the prevalence of this CNV membrane in the adult population? Well, that's not clearly known because often it's difficult and challenging to diagnose choroidal neovascularization. How is CNV diagnosed? Well, it usually takes a constellation of both clinical examination examination of color photographs, optical coherence tomography, and fluorescein angiography. Currently, fluorescein angiography remains the gold standard for diagnosing choroidal neovascularization in any part of the retina. In fluorescein angiography, we're looking over time to see a dynamic change in the amount of leakage in blood vessels, and this can occur with active choroidal neovascularization. We would see early identification of the CNV membrane and late leakage as the angiogram progress. We can see from this example from Delos and investigators in which they published this case report of choroidal neovascularization associated with optic distrusion. We could see highlighted on the color retinal photograph the abnormal membrane that grows in the subretinal space. And on the corresponding FA with the highlighted yellow arrow, we could see that abnormal hyperfluorescence from that collection of the CNV membrane, which will later leak as the fluorescein angiogram progresses. Why is identifying CNV important? We know that CNV, if it continues to grow, and is left untreated, a scar can form underneath the retina and compromise the visual acuity and the vision in this area. Fortunately, over the past decade, treatment is available for CNV. And this treatment is based on the finding that there are elevated levels of intraocular vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, in eyes with choroidal neovascularization. Therefore, scientists thought that developing a therapy that inhibits intraocular VEGF could be beneficial. And over 10 years ago, different therapies have been used, and several are FDA approved for the use to treat choroidal neovascularization. Many of these medicines are approved specifically for other retinal vascular conditions, such as wet age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and retinal vein occlusion, but they can also be used in other conditions where CNV manifests. 
This is an office-based procedure where the VEGF inhibitor, which is usually a monoclonal antibody, is injected into the vitreous cavity where it can inhibit VEGF that's inside the eye. These medicines usually are administered every one to two months until the CNV is completely inactive. So at Stanford, we were looking at the question, what is the prevalence of CNV in patients who have been referred to our pediatric and adult clinics who have optic disc drusen? We're currently conducting a retrospective review to identify all of these cases. And so far in our initial analysis, we've identified 18 eyes with cordial neovascularization. Our analysis is ongoing. But I wanted to share with you one pediatric case. This is a 10-year-old girl who had a history of optic disc drusen, and her left eye was the weaker eye that was turning in. On this most recent examination, a new finding was seen in the left fundus region, where can, we can see hemorrhage in the peripapular region, highlighted by the yellow arrow, as well Hi there. as yellow. Yes? Hi. Good. A yellow arrow. The AAN meeting is still ongoing, but. Oh. Yes. Yep. I think we're hearing um, okay. another participant right now who, um, if you'd want to mute, then we can. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. The other yellow arrow also indicates and points to a subretinal choroidal neovascular membrane. If we look at the corresponding OCT kind of heat map, we can see that there is elevation in that left peripapillary region corresponding to the subretinal CNV lesion. And the subsequent OCT scan through that area of interest also shows an abnormal hyperreflective lesion and it looks like maybe the CNV has been going on for a while because the outer retinal layers in the macular region are also disturbed. If we identify CNV, what are our therapeutic options? I mentioned anti-VEGF therapy is currently available and it's a very safe and effective treatment for choroidal neovascularization. If these CNV lesions are not visually threatening and they're maybe in the nasal peripapillary region and very small, they can be closely observed. Um, and if they progress, of course, treatment can be instigated. So my discussion points for all of our experts and our colleagues are, how can we identify those eyes that are at highest risk for developing cordial neovascularization in optic distrusion. And what leads an eye to develop CNV? We know that ischemia in the eye can lead to abnormal VEGF production, which can lead to cordial neovascular membranes. So maybe eyes that have significant optic distrusion who have ischemic events, maybe they're at higher risk for developing cordial neovascularization. We know that early diagnosis can prevent vision loss, and it's important to have a high index of suspicion for CNV, because especially in these eyes that have choroidal neovascular membranes growing in the temporal peripapillary region, those are at highest risk for progressing towards the macula, and that would impair the central vision. So I think all of us should be well aware of this complication, and hopefully we can learn more to better treat our patients and prevent further vision loss. I'd like to thank my co-investigators, Dr. Cassie Ludwig, Dr. Shannon Barris, Dr. Heather Moss, and Dr. Joyce Lau for their contributions to this research. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Diana. Um, your slides were uh, it's sort of in presenter mode, which we all recognized, um, but we weren't sure how to instruct you to change that. So <laughs> thank you everybody for bearing with us. Um, so uh, one of the questions we have um, that I had was, you know, how often do you see the recurrence of CNV uh, in your older population? I think once you have choroidal neovascularization, you're always at risk for recurrence. 
especially in other retinal vascular diseases, such as age-related macular degeneration, that's a chronic condition that needs, you know, almost lifelong therapy and close monitoring. In optic distrusion, so far the published case reports have indicated that when anti-VEGF therapy is instigated, we don't need as many treatments. I think often because the lesions are smaller and perhaps they, because they are not growing and as are active as wet AMD, they can be treated with fewer injections. But they still need monitoring once the CNV regresses. Great. So there's a question from the audience that says, um, what is the reason CNV develops in eyes with optic dystrusin? That's a very good question. I think the etiology or the um, pathogenesis is still unclear. It could be due to a combination of ischemia, some type of inflammation, some genetic risk factors. It could be multifactorial. You know, interestingly enough, we've seen that in other conditions, elevated VEGF is found in eyes, and that's why VEGF inhibitors are effective. So maybe in optic distrusion eyes where there is some underlying hypoxic uh, insult, that could be a spark or nidus for the development of CNB.